In the moonlight, I could almost forget Bartholomew was not quite alive. His sallow skin gleamed under the light of the stars. The green-gray pallor that usually tinged his face was replaced by a gentle blush. Was it possible that the cool wind whipping around us had pinched his cheeks with something close to vitality? Or was it the love he claimed to feel for me that stirred his heart back to life, giving it the power to pump blood again, coursing through those dry veins? Sitting on that desolate hillside, I realized that the hungry look in his eyes no longer scared me. I knew that it was not my brain or my death he hungered for. It was my heart, my body. The hunger was desire, and I was ready to let him feed. I passed my hand through his hair, avoiding the areas where the skin was malleable. My hand slid down and lingered on his cheek, the one with the sliver of jaw missing. Cool and clammy, he leaned into my touch. I don't know why I thought your cheek would be warm, I whispered. Evie, my darling, you speak truth in your uncertainty, Bartholomew groaned. With you I feel alive once more. My yearning tugged me toward him, and we embraced his lips warmed from my kisses, shivers tingled down my spine as his cold, mucoid fingertips traced shapes on my back. Never let me go, Bartholomew, I breathed into his ear, the one I'd stitched back only yesterday. Promise me. I promise, even if I cease to be once more tomorrow and find myself reborn again centuries from now, even then, I will never let you go. I love you, Bartholomew, I told him. The words tasted foreign in my mouth, yet felt so familiar when looking into his marble eyes. I took his hands from my back and moved them to my chest. I want you. Evie, he murmured hoarsely. Are you sure? Yet I could feel his delicate hand brushing the underside of my breast, just the faintest tips of his bony fingers. Yes, I moaned. Touch me, Bartholomew. I need to feel you everywhere. My mouth opened easily under his searing kiss. I felt our bodies fall against the grass as we pressed into each other. I could not discern where his body began and mine ended. There we were, fire and wind, life and death, love and lust becoming one underneath the pitch black sky. So, what did you guys think? Oh my oh, god, amazing, so amazing, so hot. Thank you for coming. So I just don't understand how it could technically, physically work. If he's dead, he doesn't have blood. How could he sustain an erection? <laughs> he, he, he sustains it through the power of love, Jody. I just wish he'd sustain some of the promises he's made to Evie. Mac, I am not having this argument with you again. Just not. Bartholomew has proved his love and commitment time and time again. Yeah, have what, you? Yeah. What, what about that time that she was having the grand opening for her brand new bakery and he didn't even show up to support her. What about then? Okay, he had just been kidnapped by the vampire clan, oh, Mac, okay? Please. I think getting kidnapped is a pretty good reason to miss an important engagement. Uh, exactly. yeah. <laughs> the only reason he got kidnapped is because he didn't apologize to Evie after the Risen Elder said some really problematic stuff and he just decided to go off and feel sorry for himself at the Queen Mary where he knew vampires would be hanging out. Mm, okay, mm, victim blaming. What? And, and I'll tell you something else, all right? The impetus often falls on women of color 
particularly black women, to educate white men, zombie or otherwise. Evie deserves better. That, that's a really good point, and I don't know how to respond to that. And on a side note, Evie would never have had to educate Martin about these things. <laughs> Of course. How did I know you were going to bring up Martin? At least he showed up to the opening. That's all I'm saying. He was an employee. Wait, 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 Mac. I'm so sorry. Are you a Martin Wongstad? You're goddamn right. I am. <gasps> they were best friends in high school, and I will have you know that some of the greatest romantic bonds are forged through friendship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know what's taking him so long to tell her. He is a very shy boy. Okay, and Evie deserves someone who is brave enough to be with her. Mm. She deserves someone who would eventually choose her over the close-minded risen elders. Eventually. Yes, and, and, and also, furthermore, I'd like to remind everybody that Bartholomew was super chill when Martin came out to his by. So, oh. point Bartholomew. Mm -hmm. I haven't gotten to that part yet. That's nice. Right? Evie and Martin have better chemistry. <gasps> You're out of line, Mac! And, and, and I'll tell you something else. There wouldn't be any question about how Martin's privates work. Oh, my God. Wait, so Martin's human? Yes! Yes! Oh. Okay, well, then, I guess that makes me a Martin stand, too, because they could actually have sex. <laughs> oh, my God! <laughs> sure, if you're into super boring hetero action, hey, I think hey, that's great. Hey, hey, hey. What about that dream Evie had about Martin in book two? Okay, even in her dreams, Martin's not capable of giving Evie anything more than, like, the most vanilla missionary. That is a beautiful sex position. <sighs> okay, so we have two Bart Evie stands and two sociopaths, so that's, that's good to know. Uh, but Eleanor, what do you think? Uh, I don't know. Um, it's tough because my favorite parts of the books are when Evie's like baking in the shop and I just really love reading the parts about like the way she like makes the pies and like, I guess Martin's in those scenes a lot, but he's kind of whiny. Ah! Thank you, babe. But, oh, Bartholomew's just too moody for me. I don't know. I guess I'm just an Evie stan. We're all technically Evie stans, right? That's like, like the whole point. Yeah, of course. Yeah, that's why exactly we're having Exactly what I've been saying. Mm -hmm. okay, we need a tiebreaker. Leo, what oh. do you think? Hmm? Leo? To Leo. Should our girl yep. Evie end up with the, the hot baker or the hot zombie? Um. Mm. Buddy, what you looking at there? It's just, it's just um, some, some notes, some cards, and some letters and pictures that my students mailed to me over the years. And the cards they've written talking about how much they enjoyed being in class with me. Little pictures of them in graduation holding little jabber jars. <laughs> oh, that's so sweet, Leo. Yeah. Yeah, no, I really miss them. I sent out an email to like my students and, and some alumni and most of them got back to me, but I just wish I could see them again. I'm sorry. I'm I'm bringing the whole mood down. No, 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 it's no, fine. It's no, it's okay, guys. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna go. What? Oh, Leo. Should we should we do something? Maybe one of us should call him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can do it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, if if you got the time, if, if you're not busy or anything. Uh. Yeah, no, I, I've got the time. I haven't been that busy recently. My schedule's been, like, super open. I don't know why. It's weird. <laughs> um, but, yeah, no, I can, I can call him, just check in on him, see if he's okay. Oh, turns out that my one good quality is I'm an excellent shoulder to cry on. Oh, also, I, I own for the whole trolling thing, so, yeah. I'm sure you have plenty of good qualities, Harper. Oh, geez, Maisie, watch your girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's such a huge flirt. All right, I'll see you guys next week. Bye. 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 So, uh, Maisie, are you still up for a writing workshop? Oh my god, yes, I've been looking forward to this all week. Awesome. So. Okay, well, see you later, skaters. Yeah. Oh, Elle, are we still on for a phone date later? Yeah, totally. Just give me a text when you're done. All right, cool. Bye. Bye. Bye.
And then there were two. Because those uh, big city folks got so much going on, they can't hang around with us country folk. Aw, can we be country mice instead? It makes us sound cuter. Impossible. We're already adorable as hell. <laughs> oh my gosh, speaking of mice, and this one time Maisie called me because she had a little field mouse that was stuck in her house and she oh. needed help getting it out without touching it. Oh, that's And she was, she was up on her counter, like scooting around with a broom <laughs> because she was so afraid of this itty bitty mouse. That's our Maisie. I know. She keeps telling me how excited she is to meet Edgar, but I've told her he's basically just a bigger, whinier mouse. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Be honest. I'm I'm surprised these city folks are doing so well with everything, given the circumstances. Yeah. Although I think you're forgetting that Harper ate an entire can of beans for dinner last week. Uh, true. And and I do wish somebody'd tell Jody that they don't gotta worry so much about their dissertation. All right. Yeah. Nobody's gonna be mad if if it's a little bit late. Yeah. During the zombie apocalypse, you should not have to adhere to deadlines. Or schedules. Even Maisie has a strict timeline in place about writing her novel. Yeah, how's that going? It's going good. I mean, I think in her like five year plan, she's a little bit behind, but in her short term plan, she's ahead. Or vice versa. Either way, she's always going, going, going. Yeah. About most things. I guess it's just. Maisie, she's, she's so passionate and excited about certain things, but like finishing her novel and oh, decorating her parents' house for their anniversary. Yeah. But she's like hesitant about things too. Well, like what? Like a relationship. I mean, it's really good, but we've been dating for almost eight months and for the longest while I didn't know if she actually wanted to meet up in person. I mean, I know she does now, but yeah. Why do you think that is? Um, I think she's worried because it's like her first real relationship and she doesn't want to like screw it up. Huh. She even <laughs> made this really big deal out of like exactly how we were going to say I love you to each other for the first time. Like, I just said it when I felt like it, but she spent months planning exactly how she was going to say it and when and where. And she ended up just saying it spontaneously and accidentally when we were watching a movie together one time. <laughs> I told her things like that are sweeter when they just happen like that, but I don't know. She's worried. But like, how could she even screw it up? Possibly. Like... And even if she did, hypothetically, like, we'd figure it out. We'd get through it. Listen, your 20s, they're all about screwing it up and, and figuring out what you want or, or, or what you like. That's what makes those years so special. That it's just all messiness and, and possibilities. <laughs> Hell, I'll tell you, there were many iterations of Mac over the last couple decades. <gasps> oh my gosh, I need to hear about older iterations of Mac. Uh, well, uh, young Mac definitely went through a pretty rad ska phase. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah, but that, you know, that unraveled in high school and I don't know, I guess I was just a pretty normal, weird, awkward kid with a super paranoid family. <laughs> Oh my gosh, same. I bet people aren't calling us paranoid now. No, you're goddamn right they're not. Yeah, and so after high school, well, after high school, I, I needed some time to, to figure things out. Uh, ended up starting college in my mid-20s. By that point, all my classmates were these kids just wanting me to buy them booze. What'd you study in college? I got my associates in mechanical engineering. I, I did dabble in philosophy for a time, but you know, now I couldn't tell you my hobs from my hume. That's, that's cool. Yeah. 
I haven't gone to college. I don't really know if it's for me, but if I went, I'd also be a lot older than most of my classmates. Personally, by the time I got there, I, I already knew what I wanted from life. You know, I'd, I'd figure it out who I wanted to be, who I didn't want to be. And most people just start in college, they don't know, but I, I did. I knew what I wanted from life and how I wanted to live it. And I was just waiting to, to get out there and, and start. Mm, that makes sense. Yeah, I, I grew up working on my parents' farm my whole life. And I'd always have this dream of starting a real farmer's market in our town. And then when I graduated high school, I did it. Like I started it the day after graduation. <laughs> And I've been running it ever since. And I love it. I do. I just, oh, I want to have other experiences. Like, I want to go out into the world and figure out what I like and what I don't like. And I don't know, see if I can start my own jam business. Or maybe I'll just switch fields altogether. I don't know. You, you get it. You're from a small town. It might be the best small town in the world, but there's always that little yearning for adventure do you ever feel that way i guess so but i've been, I've been a prepper for a lot of years now this whole situation we find ourselves in i've been gearing up for this for for a long time yeah well you've been a prepper your whole life and here it is now what Tell you the truth, Eleanor, I, I have not given that question a great deal of thought. I suppose I, I do really miss my sister out west and, and her wife and, and my niece. I've been thinking a lot about them, but you know, me and my sister, in our house, when we were growing up, the doomsday manual was holier even than the Bible. And so, and San Francisco right now, it's definitely a zone three. So she knows, she knows it's not safe to, to come back. Do you ever think about going out there to be with her? I mean, I know it's not safe for you to travel either, but I don't know, sometimes I think what use is all this prepping and safety if we don't share it with the people we care about. Damn. I thought I was the one who was supposed to be given all the insightful wisdom. <laughs> we can both be wise, Mac. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I guess we can. Yeah, there were a couple of words here that I didn't understand. Well, I mean, like, I understood them, but I'm wondering if maybe, like, like, do you, could you do like an appendix for this thing or? Yeah, I mean, that's reasonable. Okay, I think that would be good. Did you feel like there was anything that was like a barrier to entry, like a big X oh. saying, this is not for you, this is not oh. for you? Oh, no, 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 no. I think it was pretty easy to like deduce through like context clues and whatnot. Um, but it's so cool that you're thinking of that. Um, but um, yeah, other than that, I think it's really great. I think you did a wonderful job with it. I didn't know that anthropology writing could be so beautiful. Oh, thank you. That's, you're being too nice. No, no, I'm being serious. No, listen, okay, like, I knew that we were going to feature heavily in this, right, but I didn't know how heavily you know, like, I sort of imagined that I would be reading this, like, super science-y research paper where the analysis was, like, super clinical and, like, super distant. Like, it would feel like you were just reading something from a textbook. Um, but no, like, it felt really human. And I think you did such a lovely job, like, exploring these themes of, like, found family and, like, coming together as a community during times of crisis. And I don't know, I think people are going to find a lot of solace in this. 
Okay, honestly, that is a huge belief to hear because that is something that I really did worry about. Like, is this relatable on a broader scale? And I really wanted to capture a snapshot of the group and of each person in the group to convey how important it has been finding each other and, you know, being there for one another. Well, I think you nailed it. Thank you. So what are you going to do when you finish it for realsies? Oh, God, I don't know. Uh, I guess I can change my handle to at Dr. JP007, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. But beyond that, most of my colleagues have abandoned the campus. I have no idea where my primary readers went. In all likelihood, my dissertation will probably just sit on my laptop collecting proverbial dust. What? No, Jody. This is this is really important. People need to read this. You need to you need to shut this from the fucking rooftops. Nobody wants to read this, and I don't have rooftop access in this building. Okay. So. Do you have a radio station on campus? Yes, of course we do. A very pretentious gullet radio station. That. You have to get on that, and you need to share this with as many people as you can. No, listen, like, not to be, like, dramatic or anything, but, like, I think people really need to know how important it was for us to, like, come together as a community, and that's the only thing that kept us from losing our goddamn mind. Like, people are gonna want to read this, Jody. Okay, all right. You have convinced me to think about it, but I want to move on to your piece. Oh, boy. Okay, I'm ready. So, first and foremost, I want to say how surprised I was by the genre. Definitely in a good way. I really think that the world needs more period piece romances between women, and the fantasy element where one of them is a time traveler from the 21st century is just, oh, so your aesthetic. Um, I don't know what to say. It was beautiful and sweet and very funny. Oh my god, thank you. Okay, can you tell me what your favorite scene was? I mean, like, if no pressure, like, if you don't have one, like, that's totally fine, but... Okay, so I definitely cried when Lydia found the letter from Katie. Oh, my heart. So, if I had one thing that you might want to look at. More zombies, one. you're absolutely right. No, 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 I think the lack no? of zombies is fine. Okay. What I was going to say was the sex scenes, while tasteful, are maybe a little too polished. Like, it is so clear that these women love each other so much and there's so much sexual tension, but the scene where they make love the first time, ah, I want... I don't think the narrative needs an entire chapter of them planning it out. It, it just felt a little unrealistic. That's uh, how I had sex for the first time. Oh. Oh, oh my god, no, 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 but uh, that's, it's totally fine. I am here to listen to your feedback. Please, continue. Um, oh, well, in that case, maybe I would suggest that you look even deeper into your own experiences, romantic and physical. I'm so sorry. That was too far. It was too personal. Forget no, I said anything. No, 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 no. It's okay. It's okay. It's just that, um, what if I'm scared to do that? Um, to be so open and messy um, in my writing, um, because I like where it's at now. It's at a good place, and I'm happy with it, um, and I'm worried that I'm gonna fuck it up. I'm worried that if I try to make it better, I'm going to screw it up. It's gonna be bad. I'm going to do it bad. I'm going to I'm going to do it wrong. I'm going to I'm gonna write it wrong. Um so I can only speak from my experience, but writing is a lot more exciting when you put yourself fully into it. Like it's scary, right? And you think Okay, if I don't try, if I don't put myself fully out there, then I can't fail, right? But if you don't try, you do fail yourself. 
and your partner by not listening to who you really are and what you really want. And even though it is scary, I think ultimately it is better to put yourself fully out there and just dive right into the deep end of your writing. Um, yeah, uh, that makes sense. Um, you know, it's uh, funny because I seem to recall somebody very wise and very stylish telling you something similar about sharing your writing. So. Okay, I'm feeling, oh, what is the word that the kids use? Very attacked right now. Oh my God, Jody, you're so lame. No one's used that phrase in a million. Up to me that morning and he, he kind of just says that he doesn't want to be a baseball player anymore because he thinks he's too short. And so I, I, I tell him, you know, Tommy, there are so many short athletes and you need all kinds of athletes to make a team, right? And so the next day during recess, I see him and he's, man, I mean, he's grinning from ear to ear and he's stepping up to the plate and he hits that ball. And I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't go far, right? It just kind of like hits the ground and, and rolls a little bit into the grass, but geez, he was, he was thrilled about it. Oh my God. That's so cute. Yeah. Yeah. It was the cutest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> and he's a great kid too, except the following week, he told me that he thought of me as Atticus Finch when we were reading To Kill a Mockingbird. Wait, why do you say that like it's a bad thing? Because Atticus Finch is old. Yeah, but Atticus Finch is hot. <laughs> you really miss your kids, huh? Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I do. It's uh. I just feel kind of lost without them. It's like sometimes I wake up in the morning and I start packing my lunch and then I realize that I can't go to work, right? Or I'll, I'll spend most of my shower time thinking about lesson plans. What a waste of valuable shower time. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, Harper, it just, I don't know who I am if I'm not teaching. Right, I've always wanted to be a teacher. I love doing it, everything. I love getting the kids excited about reading. I love chaperoning field trips and, and, and school dances. I love keeping my door open at lunch so they can come and talk to me. I'm sorry, I shouldn't be. What, what, Leo, no, you don't have to apologize. It's just, I don't know. I don't know what my purpose is if I'm not a teacher. Just because you're not actively teaching right now doesn't mean you're not a teacher. I mean, you've obviously had a really big impact on these kids. You're, you're part of who they are and who they're becoming. You know, that doesn't just stop because you're not actively teaching them right now. It's not a one-time thing. It's like, it's like the gift that keeps on giving or whatever, you know? You make other people feel so special and, and important because you're so special and important. To your students. Uh, I am. Um, thank you, Harper. Yeah, no problem, whatever. Yeah, it's just for, for seven years, my mind has been hardwired to cycle through teaching and, and prepping and, and this stupid relationship that I don't even care about anymore. You know, it's like, I, it was the longest relationship I've ever had. And I just keep falling back on it like a bad habit. What do you mean like a bad habit? It's just, I, I keep thinking about it, right? When I go out with my friends or when I'm doing laundry, it's, it's this autopilot. I'm not trying to think about it. It's just happening. And it's so frustrating because I don't, I really, I really don't care about that relationship or that person anymore. I'm sick of wasting my time on, on wasting time thinking about it. 
but I'm done. Right? I'm, I'm done with this. I just want to focus my energy on things that make me happy, like teaching and, and, the, and this forum and, and you guys. But first, I'm going to go back in time and I'm going to kick 18-year-old Leo's ass for fucking asking out the first person that he met at an ice cream social. <laughs> oh, God. Jesus. What is an ice cream social? <laughs> orientation thing. I don't know. Oh, Leo. Okay. Would it make you feel better if I told you about, like, like an actual bad decision? Like, like a real bad decision? Like, okay. Like a permanent, stupid, bad decision. How stupid? Stupid, stupid. <laughs> okay, I'm listening. Oh, uh, okay. Ugh, okay, so <laughs> a couple of years ago, I went to this party in Bushwick. It was just like a friend of a friend's. And um, by the time I got there, I'd already shotgunned a couple of PBRs. So make of that what you will. And uh, the host of the party had a dog. <laughs> and um, my, my friend Trish, uh, the girl I went with, her name is Trish. At the time, <laughs> the time she was studying to be a tattoo artist. Oh, no. Uh, Harper, no. I know, no, I know, I know. Okay, just let this happen. Okay. Oh, my God. Uh, okay, okay, okay. So, <laughs> in a completely unhinged effort to commemorate this stranger's dog, I convinced Trish to give me a tattoo. Oh my god. Yeah. Wow. Right there at the party. Oh, in the bathroom at the party. Right then and there. I, I mean, I just have so many questions about hygiene. Right, me too. <laughs> you got... A tattoo of a stranger's dog? Um, Leo, I mean, obviously this dog was so much more than that to me at the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did. Oh, oh, but the issue was that at the time, Trish was not sober, and uh, she was also not yet a licensed tattoo artist. Sure, right, because, you know, why would she be? Right, of course, right. So, in the cold harsh morning light, I awoke to find just, just the most cursed looking tattoo I have ever seen in my entire life. Leo, I can't even tell you how bad it is. It's, it's, oh my god, it's indescribably horrible. I didn't even know it was a dog until Trish told me a couple days later. That's how bad it is. Okay, Harper, listen, I, you can't tell me me this extremely exciting story and oh. not show me that tattoo. No, Leo, I cannot show you this tattoo. I'm so sorry. What? Why not? Um, I don't think our friendship can handle it. Oh my god, you're such a tease. Uh, okay, okay. First of all, it is just unspeakably ugly. I feel like I'm not making myself clear. It is, it is just so powerfully disgusting. It is nasty. It looks it looks wrong, okay? It's just, it's ugly. And additionally, it may be on a very private part of my anatomy. Oh. Yeah, let's just say that um, this dog remains very near and dear to my heart. Um, yeah, that's, that only partially satiates my curiosity. Oh, tragic. Yeah, I mean, I mean uh, Harper, what if you, uh, could you send like a, a, a picture of the tattoo, just the tattoo, I mean, it, oh, or, okay. or you, you could draw it on a piece of paper. I just, I really want to know what it looks like. Are you trying to get me to send you nudes, Leo? No, I'm absolute no. This is for academic purposes only. Sure it is. It I curious minds want to know. Uh, okay, okay, fine. I will oh, Okay, fine, fine. I will send you a picture of the tattoo, but you have to 
promise not to share this with anybody. No, you have to, seriously, Leah, you have to swear. You have to swear not to share this with anybody. Okay, pinky promise. God, oh my god, you're such a dork. <laughs> yeah. Okay, oh my god, okay, fine. Ah, ah, BRB. Okay. <laughs> Okay, I sent you a DM via the forum. Okay. <laughs> oh my god. Oh god, no, I know it's so cursed. Ah. <laughs> it looks like, like a cryptid got run over by a truck. Oh. Um, the tattoo, that the tattoo, not not your um not your your breast. Oh my god, you're a real charmer, Mr. Solano. <laughs> like, I'm sorry, I just, it, it's just, <laughs> I, I don't have any tattoos, like, otherwise I would show you, but, oh my god, it's so cross-eyed, and yet it feels like it can see me. Oh, and it, like, those god. Ears, they make it look like a sock puppet. Are those, oh, like, god, those are sense. five legs, right? Oh. Is that a leg? Oh my god, Leo, this conversation is totally unbalanced. I'm sorry. I just, I will always treasure this, Harper Young. And if I ever get a tattoo in some ungodly place, I will make sure you're the first one to see it. After the tattoo artist, of course. I'm holding you to that. And... If it's any consolation, would it help if I said that you are a really good friend? Um, yeah, that helps. <laughs> All right then, deal. Deal. <laughs> oh, um, oh my gosh, look at the time. I should probably, uh, probably go fill my bagel bites. <laughs> Um, <laughs> but I'll see you next week, Leo. Okay, yeah, um, I'll see you next week, Harper. Take care, okay? You too. Okay. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>